You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got George Marcherano. How are you, George, boy? Well, I'm happy to be here, James. Uh, James is my new friend from uh, uh, Scotland, and uh, I've never been over there. I would love to go over there. I like to go to the lake with a ne- ne- was it, Netflix monster. Ne- oh, the Loch Ness monster. Loch Ness monster, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you look great. It's just so beautiful country anyway. Anyway, I'm George Marcherano. I'm here today. Talk about myself. Uh, I did uh, 32 plus years in prison. I'm from, uh, my father was in the mob. My godfather was the boss of Philadelphia for many, many years. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they had, they came to bad endings, violent endings, my godfather and my father. <clears throat> but I wasn't in the mob per se. I was in the marijuana business. I started in the marijuana business uh, when I was very young, very young. And uh, Right now, I'm trying to develop my TV series. Uh, I, I'm the Grow Father, ladies and gentlemen. You're talking to the Grow Father. That's my brand. You heard of the Godfather? I'm the Grow Father. And we have cannabis factories in Jersey and uh, and uh, California. And I have a beer. I have a beer in New Jersey called the Grow Father. And another beer that I have is called Mugshot. It's actually my, my prison mugshot on the can. So what I'm an expert at is I... <clears throat> take all that negativity in my life, you know, I didn't come out of jail. Basically half my life in a cell, literally half my life in a cell. I didn't come out of prison with any neg- negativity. And uh, because, uh, you know, if you come out with a chip on your shoulder and you got hate, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. So uh, I'm proud of what I'm doing. The most important thing that I'm proud of, I'm creating jobs, creating jobs for young people. And that's what everyone should be doing, especially people in the neighborhoods, like my neighborhood, the <clears throat> neighborhoods in, the, in South Philadelphia. Uh, so like I said, my life was started uh, in turmoil, very young. I was on a lamb at two years old. You know, on a lamb means, no. uh, in mob language, that means you're hiding. So two years old, they, I was hiding. The reason why uh, my neighborhood, like I said, was very ethnic. Uh, actually, the street, the street I lived on, uh, had a nickname called Gunman's Row. It's actually it was a street with cafes and little mom and pop stores, and uh, all they all tough guys and a lot of people, business people, would come down Gunman's Row and hire a guy to do something, usually to go collect debts. So I was raised on the street, uh, Gunman's Row, and one of the. Uh, uh, gangsters on that block is named Benny, Benny the Gimp. And he was a tough gangster and he used to carry two, two long nose 38s. Anyway, for some reason, he really liked me as a child and he used to come and bang on my door and my mother used to shake, giving me to him. And he would take me to the corner store with you know, ice cream with the stroller and he would buy me ice cream and I'd get it all over myself and he would laugh. And that's what he liked till till one day, uh, me and him are on the corner and I'm in a stroller and I'm eating my ice cream and he's sitting there and the car jumped the payment with a driver and two guys in the back. They jumped out and then they killed him right there. So my mother hears the shots and she runs out of the house and scoops me up. So when the cops get there and the homicide detectives, they want to know who's the baby attached to the stroller, the baby carriage. So they're looking all over, right? And uh, they actually took me from my house, uh, from my grandmother's around the corner. But the search still intensified. So they moved me from not only out of the city of Philadelphia, they moved me all the way to a seashore town in New Jersey. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would, I was in the life before I knew I was in the life. <laughs> mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, I was raised in a working class family, very big. We had big businesses. We controlled all the vending 
and fill up, you know, pinball machines, jukeboxes, pool tables, cigarette machines. We controlled all that uh, for many, many years. And then uh, uh, my godfather was killed. He was ambushed, Angelo Bruno. And uh, who was he? He was my godfather. He was the boss of Philadelphia for 22 years. So uh, I said, oh, I ain't working no more. You know, I'm working. He kept me very strict. So I went off into the weed business. Did you ever go to school, George? School? Yeah, I went to school. Actually, I I, uh, I bought a whole school, basically bribing that the school. When I graduated eighth grade, I didn't want to go four years of high school. I hell with that. So I made a connection with a private school in town, very expensive. Instead of going for four years, you do it two years. And I had the whole school. <clears throat> so I was making a lot of money selling weed and hash around the school. I had a brand new car and uh, I was doing good. I loved it there. Until this kid, Frankie. Frankie was from a wealthy family, but he was a little nuts. And he used to follow me around. Anything I did, he would uh, do. So he shows up in the school. I said, oh, no. I said, Frankie, you know, do the right thing. I says, I got a good hair. Beautiful girls, very rich girls. I says, I got a good hair. Don't screw up. Don't screw up. And the, the school was in Center City where all the big restaurants were and the, the big hotels. When I, lunchtime, I didn't go to no cafeteria or anything. I went to a fine restaurant in, in the area. So I had my little girlfriend then at the time, and uh, her name was Janie, beautiful little girl. And uh, we went and had yeah, lunch. And we're walking out. She says, look. I looked, there was a big cloud of smoke. Something was on fire. I said, geez, that looks like where the school's at. <laughs> so we we gone that way. Sure enough, the whole school's burning down. This kid, Frankie, and they got, when I get closer, they got Frankie in back of a cop car, handcuffed back of the cop car. What this crazy kid did, he went and set a fire in the fuse box in the basement. Why would you do that? In the fuse box, it was big. A 200-year-old school he burned to the ground. And uh, the family was wealthy. The only reason he didn't go to jail, he had to go to a nut house for a while because they said he was crazy. So you went and did about a year in a nut house. So, so that's my that was as far as my education is concerned. But I was very, very wise in business. And then, uh, like I said, I always like I, I'm hoping to do my TV series called The Grow Father, and it's going to be talking about all my life with cannabis. Cannabis was, but those 32 plus years I did in jail, nonviolent first offender, I was set up. You know, that sentence still applies until today. There's a sentence that's been going around for hundreds of years in the legal system. The hardest case to beat is a frame. The hardest case to beat is a frame. When you're framed, very hard to beat because they're not going to throw people under the bus for you. And uh, <clears throat> they put the cuffs on me in 1983. Uh, I was in Florida. And it was September 19th. They put the cuffs on me, and I didn't see. I was in solitary for five years. Five years in solitary before I went into the regular system to finish out the remainder of the 32 years. What did you do after school? What did you do after school? After school? Yeah. Back then? Yeah. Shop, go with girls. Were you making good money? As a kid, yeah, making good money, making thousand two thousand a day as a kid what sort of people you were you surrounded with then uh because your family was involved with the mafia yeah but in center city was mixed very wealthy jewish people uh things like that there wasn't much too much tain ethnic up that way i don't want to be around that i wanted to be different you know be things i was raised with that and matter of fact that when i got older in that area, it was very high end area. I was, uh, we had a nightclub. And uh, I told my guys, my guys from the neighborhood, you're not allowed up here. 
<laughs> you stay down in the neighborhood. I had bars down here. You stay down here. And uh, finally they beg, oh, come on, let us come uptown. Let us come uptown. Uh, I said, well, you've got to dress right. I said, what we'll do, I'll, I'll fight you up there for New Year's. Oh, thank you, boss. Thank you, boss. So they all come to this club, private club for New Year's. I didn't realize in South Philly, New Year's, everybody go, back then, everybody go out in the house and they shoot guns. <clears throat> they shoot guns. So New Year's, 12 o'clock came. They ran out of this nightclub in a real rich neighborhood in Center City and they start shooting. They start shooting. And uh, the, the owner of the place, he went crazy. He said, I know, well, they're, they're shooting guns. They're shooting guns. <laughs> so I said, well, that's what they do in South Philly. And uh, you know, my life, uh, Bracey's a river story. It's just the stories in prison uh, are unbound. Uh, I think uh, the people all over the world know about John Gotti. Uh, there was several movies made about him, several books, several documentaries. He was a good friend of mine. He was, he was my celly. Uh, for over two years, so we very, very close mm -hmm. at the time, very close. And uh, you know, uh, how much weed were you selling before you got to prison? I wasn't at that stage of the game. I wasn't selling anything. I was just brokering it. In other words, if you wanted to buy weed, I pitch you with a guy, middleman. Yeah, and I just brokered it, and I get my end. After you've been in the business so long, you don't have to do anything but broker deals. Mm -hmm. And I used to broker deals out of uh, Costa Rica. I used to broker deals out of uh, Colombia, broker deals out of Jamaica, and uh, and so forth and so on. So you become a broker. But now, illegal. <clears throat> I did 32 years for conspiracies to uh, marijuana. Now I own my own two companies. It's legal, uh, most of America, most of the world. So, and... Uh, but again, I take negative and I turn it into positive. Like I said, my brand is called the Grow Father. Yeah, where did, how much were you paying a kilo back then? Oh, uh, in the early days, 20 bucks. A kilo? Yeah, in the early days. Right. So, see, you got to understand the industry. Now, today, in, 19, <clears throat> in the early 90s, California started developing strains. They were getting seeds from Afghanistan. They started de developing different strains. And that's where we are today. You have a variety of different cannabis. There's low, low end, very expensive, it's different strains. But back in my day, there was only one strain in the world. It was called a rubella strain. And the only re reason it looked a little different was the country that it was being like Mexico was like red bud, Costa Rica red bud. Colombia was the Colombian gold. Jamaica was the Sensi. But it was still one strain, the Rubella strain. But today, it's several different strains. It's all different today. What do you think about the weed from today compared to oh, back it's then? It's way stronger today. It way better, up, eh? way, way better, way stronger. Why is that? Like I said, I have my own factory now, so we make several different kinds. There's, only, there's three kinds of marijuana There's there's indigo, which is more of a downer, relaxes you. There's sativa, which gives you energy. And then there's a hybrid. Hybrid is a mixture between the indigo and sativa. So, and it's so, so basically, it's about, it's like dealing in the industry today. It's like you, there's cooks that make uh, pretty good food. And then there's chefs who make great food. Well, same thing in the cannabis industry in our factory. We got uh, very talented young people that really know to make make it better. So your life is going good. You're making a bit of money. You've got all the girls. When did it start turning? When when, when did the police start looking out for you? Why did they choose you? Uh, I, I used to, back then, I used to have a personal attorney. Everywhere I went, he was my lawyer. <clears throat> he only worked for me. And he got uh, infiltrated by another lawyer in Florida. And the lawyer was got busted for something, and he went and worked for the FBI. And this lawyer told the FBI, I can, I can deliver George Martorano. When they heard me, 
They stopped everything. Why? Because Nance, like, you know, the government don't want to, don't want to, the FBI don't want to lock up a homeless guy. They're not going to get any recognition. They're not going to get any advancement. Promotion. With their jobs. So they needed a name. And uh, and uh, I never forget when I got to life, no parole. The first time, I got it twice. The first time I got life, no parole was 1984. <clears throat> And I'm sitting in a bullpen waiting to go back to the jail. And uh, this one lead FBI agent came back. He says, Mark Toronto, we didn't want you to get this sentence. You're going to have to, your lawyer didn't do what you're supposed to do. Well, I, my lawyer sold me out. We didn't want you to get life no parole because life no parole means you come home in a body bag. No offense and buts, you come home in a body bag. Okay, it took me 32 years to beat that. And I beat it after spending over three million in lawyers. I beat it myself. My brain beat it. And I don't want to get into any of that legal talk or stuff. The audience wouldn't want to understand it. But, uh, and that's the way it was. That was the way it was. I was all the worst prisons. The worst prisons you can imagine. How old were you when they came for you? Well, they wanted me to rat. Bottom of line, they figured... Pressure him, pressure him, pressure him, and they wouldn't let up. They pressured me, pressured me, they wanted me to. So you got to understand, Philadelphia, <clears throat> at the time, right before I got arrested, we had three mob wars, back to back mob wars. A lot of people were killed. A lot of people were killed in Jersey and, uh, and Philadelphia. And uh, no arrests. No arrests. So I get pinched on this. A conspiracy for marijuana, and they, Washington, D.C., said, crucify him, crucify him, get him to talk, get him to talk, which is not fair. After you get life, no parole, that's the worst sentence you can get in the world, okay? Why would you keep pressuring me? Why would you keep, uh, it's it, basically what they did was illegal. I mean, I was punished enough by getting life, no parole, and now you want to punished me further, so much so, uh, James, that they kept me in solitary for five years. And uh, at one, one jail, and they sent me to the worst jail in America. The worst jail in America was called Marion in Marion, Illinois. There was only 370 of the worst prisoners in the country. And I never, I never even had a parking ticket. So, uh, you know, I'm in this jail and uh, But um, um, when I was in the jail, when I was in the jail, I had to go back to Philadelphia on a writ. A writ means uh, your warden signs you to go back to Philadelphia for court. And I had to go back to court for just a simple thing. And, uh, but at that time, every jail, whether it was a little county jail, a big state prison, whatever, they hated marrying prisons. They hated because one month before I got there, they just had killed two guards. They killed two guards brutally. So anything, if you're traveling, Jack, it said, Marion, you were going to be abused. And this one jail in East, uh, uh, East St. Louis is jail. They take me in this jail and uh, take me down the hall. And they open another sealed door and they take me down to the basement. Right? And they put me in boxcar cells, which were illegal. Boxcar cells were condemned, I think, in the 30s, early 40s. A boxcar cell is, uh, it's, it's got two, two stale doors, okay? And uh, it's all steel inside. You don't have a window. It's called a boxcar. And they stuck me in there. And when they feed you, they actually feed you like an animal. There was, on the bottom of the, each door, there's a flap, okay? And they get a stick and they push your food in through the two doors. They don't open them. That's how they fed you. In this particular jail, it was one little light bulb, one little light bulb. And the light bulb went out after two days. I'm in total darkness. And, and I'm banging on the door when the guy would bring the food. I says, hey, I need a light bulb. I need a light bulb. They wouldn't give me. And I went almost two weeks in the dark. And I believe that's the, probably the most worst torture you can give an individual. Uh, 
out there, out there who's ever watching this YouTube, I want you to go in your closet, shut the light, and just try to stay in there an hour and see how you feel. You imagine almost two weeks in the dark. Well, listen, I almost lost my mind. You know, I yelled for a light bulb. I screamed for a light bulb. And just one day when the food, the food was coming through the slot, I, and you're down on your knees getting it, I looked under the bunk, there was a pencil. I didn't see it before. It was a pencil. Well, that saved my brain, and that was the start of a writer. I wrote, I wrote 31 works in prison. I wrote books, <clears throat> movie scripts, stage plays, poetry, short stories. No one has written more prolific than me in prison ever in America, ever. I wrote over two million words freehand. And uh, so I got this pencil, and uh, I'm writing on the floor. I really can't see what I'm writing. I'm writing on the wall. I can't, I, I'm saying the words and writing them. And that's what saved me. And I, I remember the day they finally took me out of there. One of the guards says, he wrote all over the cell. And that, that saved my sanity. And the pencil, how I sharpened it was with my teeth. How was the court case? How long did the court case last? Oh, my God. I fought for 32 years. No, did well, beforehand, before, when they charged you with conspiracy to support. Oh, it takes about a year. <clears throat> the court case, you go back and forth from court, took, it takes about a year. And what were you thinking? Did you realize? I was fighting the this uh, CCE, Continual what, Criminal Enterprise. What evidence did they have? Yeah, nothing. I wasn't even in the warehouse. I wasn't even there, but... There's only two cases, James, in the history of America where the government gave you the drugs, made you sell the drugs, and keep the money. One was a guy named Freeway Ricky Ross out of L.A. You might have heard the case during the Contra uh, War in Nicaragua where the CIA was giving uh, Freeway Ricky Ross coke to sell, and that money was supporting the Iran-Contra War. In Nicaragua. And then my case, my case was they gave us the weed, gave guys that worked for me, they gave us the weed and made us keep the money. The law is if you give somebody illegal drugs, if the FBI gives you an illegal drug and you take it and you take one step away, they're supposed to arrest you because you committed the act. You took the drugs, committed the act. They gave us the drugs, made us sell it, and we sold it for like a little over 700,000, okay, back then. And uh, they made us keep the money. It's totally illegal. Totally illegal. So how can they give... <clears throat> so they working undercover or is it a deal with... Yeah, it the, was undercover because back then <clears throat> in the 70s in Miami, Miami was, was rocking, with, you know, rocking with the drug culture, rocking cocaine, weed, you name it. And... Uh, Sounds like my So it wasn't it wasn't uncustomary for a guy to get in trouble and his lawyer wanted might have wanted a million bucks. They give him some cash and they say, I don't have it, I'll give you weed or I'll give you cocaine. That wasn't uncommon back then. Then your lawyer would know somebody to get rid of it. Well, that's what this this lawyer did. He told my lawyer, my personal lawyer, listen, I got some weed from a client, I want to ship it up there. So they shipped it up three times, a 2,600 pound. By shipping it three times, it com committed, it's called overacts, three overacts, which created the ongoing criminal enterprise, CCE, which is life, life to no, no, no parole. So see when you're going through your court case and you're fighting against them, did you ever think that you would get life? They couldn't get, they couldn't, my... And when you when you get sent when you're found guilty, they have a department, the probation department, the parole board, and probation is the same thing. They prepare what you call uh, I get the name, the legal name. They prepare and they recommend this. They, they give it to the judge what they recommend you should get, and they scrutinize your whole case. They they recommend to the judge, and the judge usually goes by that. 10 out of 10 times they go with that. Mine, of course, I was a nonviolent offender, first offender. My guidelines were 48 to 52 months. I couldn't have did more than 52 months. I wind up over three decades in prison. Why? 
because again, it was all it was all conspired by Washington uh, FBI, Philadelphia FBI. They needed. I never was in jail before. They're embarrassed. They're embarrassed because they had all these killings. No one was arrested. I'm talking about a lot of killings. But the, you must have been a big player then, George, for you to get over 30 years when there's guys doing killings, doing 15 and 20 years. Well, I was always around. My godfather was the boss. My father was a top guy. They figured, I got to know something. But you got to remember when they're, when they're uh, uh, surveillance on these mob guys, I'm always there. I'm at a restaurant. I'm over there. So I'm always there. But I'm not, I'm not killing people. Okay, but I'm always around. Have they given you that sentence, hoping that you would break and start right. giving that names? That was all it was about. And I had wardens. When I did those five years in solitary, the, the wardens used to come by my cell. In jail, any any hole in jail, the hole, solitary, the ward makes rounds every week. He'll come around. That's Every week you're going to see the ward. And I had more than one more, several more. They says, Mark Toronto, I don't have you back here. Understand that. I don't have you back here. It's that prosecutor's office in Philly. And I don't like what they're doing to you. I said, you know, when I said, you know, sound becomes very prevalent in prison. You know sounds. You know keys. You know, you start hearing keys. You know, guards coming. You know when the food cart's coming. He he sounds very uh, prevalent in prison. So I used to hear the warden coming, and I was always in shape. You know, I jumped down on the floor, and I go one thousand two, <laughs> one thousand three, <laughs> one thousand four. Right? The warden was oh, Toronto, jump up. You like that? I says, yeah. He says, and he would say, you know, I don't have you back there. I jump back down one thousand. I says, warden, tell that prosecutor to bring it. Tell him to bring it. He wasn't breaking me. Why didn't you break? Because some of these men out here who are stone cold killers, part of that family, fucking turned in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. Heartbeat because they they actually, you have a license to be a criminal. You have a license to be a killer. You All you have to do is do it. Do the crime with other people, one other people or more, and give them up. So that's that's what's that's why I do a lot of speaking. I do a lot of speaking to young people in the schools, and that's what I tell them: don't throw your life away, <clears throat> because the people that you think are your friends are not your friends. <clears throat> so I do a lot of speaking with that. Why did you stay strong? Why did you not fold or break? When the majority of people who I speak to now, all the films <laughs> and all the books written, the major, every one of them. Well, because I loved, I loved my. I, I was raised with three sisters. I had my mother, my aunts. I'm never going to let my mother bend her head in shame. My mother, when I did all those 32 years, my mother went to all the best places in New York, mob restaurants, best restaurants in New York, Philly, you name it. And she went in with her head up. I would rather be dead than have my mother bend her head in shame. Never would let that happen. Or my sister's. See when you got a life sentence, what's going through your mind? You know, you're you're. I didn't show it, but you're emotionally you're emotionally shocked, you know. And you got the worst thing it was. I had two children, you know. I had a four year old girl, beautiful woman I live with now, my Francesca, and uh, my boy Raymond, and uh, my children. They took me away from my children for thirty some years. I mean, what what man? Whether you're a judge, prosecutor, FBI, what, why would you? I would never think about doing that to someone. Nonviolent first offender. All right, then let me do four or five years so I can come back and be with my children. But like I said, this prosecutor in my case, very, very evil man, uh, he did so many things. After I got the life, no parole, I've been punished enough. I got the worst sentence in America probably in the world. And uh, and he just kept coming at me, kept coming at me. Torture me, torture me. I, I'd be at one jail in the hole. See, it's illegal. 
It's illegal to keep somebody five years in solitary. The only way you can do five years in solitary, you got to be a, an inmate or convict that gets out in population. You kill a guy. <clears throat> then you go back. To, the only people that kept that long in, are psychopaths in, in solitary. And that's what they did to me. Why did they keep you five years in solitary? It could have went more. I got myself out. Were, I, you, were you causing mayhem? Were you doing no, damage? No, nothing. I was, I was, you can't do nothing. You're locked in. You're locked in by yourself for five years. It seems extreme. But it's illegal what they did. You can't keep a man like that if his record, his prison record or his courtroom record does not warrant. I'm nonviolent. Did you, did you fuck the judge? Did you fuck his wife or something? <sighs> Who knows? Anyway, that's uh, a bit extreme though for weed, like you say, six years maximum. But well, then... they kept moving me. They kept moving me everywhere from four to six months. They moved me to another jail because it was illegal doing what they were doing to me. My family didn't know where I was at for years. Didn't know where I was at. So when you're in solitary, how did you get through that five years? Was that just well, a... some jails fed better than others? <clears throat> in the course of that five years in solitary. There was a counselor came to see me. He says, you know, March around, we don't like what being do it, what's being done to you. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to ship you to Springfield, Illinois. It's a medical facility. And we're going to put you in a psychiatric department. And if they feel that this lockdown, the solitary, isn't deteriorating you mentally, We'll ship you. You're going to have to come back here to Marion, worst prison in America. You're going to leave here, come back, and then we'll ship you. So try to get a good report. I didn't think through it. So anyway, we leave to get in the van a couple of days later, and we're, we're headed. We got to go about eight, 900 miles uh, to the jail. And uh, no, I think five, six, and anyway, so... I'm in the van, me, a Spanish guy, and a mountain man. And Marion, they had mountain men. The reason they had mountain men, like places like Montana, Wyoming, uh, they didn't have maximum security prisons. So these mountain men, this governor would ship them to Marion, and they would pay to keep them. So we're in a van with this mountain guy, beard, this... This, these kind of guys do 2,500 push-ups a day. And uh, so we're in the van, and uh, he says, yeah, what do you feel like eating? I says, I don't know. I said, they probably got a bag lunch for us up front. He says, nah, what do you want to eat? You want Kentucky Fried Chicken? You want uh, 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 Burger King, McDonald's? I said, what are you going? He said, what do you want? I said, oh, I can go for some Kentucky Fried Chicken. He says, okay. He stands up. Stands up and he gets the, he was huge. He gets the van and he's starting to rock it. He starts slowly, but after a while, the, the vans start coming off its wheels. And the guards are screaming. You got two guards up in front and you got two guards in a crash car in the back. And hey, stop, stop. He says, hey, we want... Kentucky Fried Chicken, and this van is getting turned over. This guy's in for life. Probably got, I think he killed the, uh, what do you call them? Uh, the Rangers in the forest. What are they called? Uh, Park Rangers? Game, game Warden. <laughs> killed the Game Warden. So, uh, <laughs> so sure enough, we eat Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> I said, this is good. So we eat, go a couple more hours. He says, you feel like having a McDonald's? I said, yeah. He saw it. He said, again. Yeah. Sure enough, we were shaking that van. We had, the Mexican loved it, right? But make a long story short, I said, when I get to Springfield, again, I forgot. They, everywhere you want, uh, you are marrying prisoner, they hated you. They wanted to kill you because Marion prisoners kill guards. I never killed the guard, but I got to Marion right before I got there. They killed two guards. Forget about killing each other. They killed two guards. So they put me in a criminally insane unit. 
I was there for a psychiatric evaluation. You're supposed to be in a regular uh, dorm or something with other prisoners. And you get psychiatry evaluated. And they put me in a criminally insane unit. They take me in a cell, James. First, they strip you. And they give you paper clothes. Paper clothes. Everything's made out of paper. Even your bedding is paper. <clears throat> because in the criminal insane unit, they don't want you hanging up. The clothes wouldn't support you. The bedding wouldn't support you. It's made out of paper. So then, and they put my, never forget, I still have trouble with this. I have a weak, weak ankle. They put a leg iron on my left ankle to the bunk. I only could reach the food slot or the toilet. And that's how they kept me through this uh, observation. Criminally insane, you know. So about the middle of the night, i never forget, first night I was there, a lieutenant came about 2, 3 in the morning. There was some mob bosses on another section of the prison. They heard I was there. Fat Tony Salerno, I don't know if you ever heard of Fat Tony. He was, he was a boss for many, many years, 40 years anyway. He sent this lieutenant. He says, hey, Martirano, he's whispering through the door. They're going to hit you with the Stark treatment. Stark, S-T-A-R-K, Stark. I said, for what? He said, they're going to try to get you to be violent. He said, he said whatever you do, don't go off. Don't go off. I says, I'm in, I'm in here chained to the bed. So they put you what you call the Stark treatment, Dr. Stark. They would bring you all your meals, your three meals, say four in the morning, five in the morning, frozen. All your meals frozen. You know, right? They want you to, to react. Then uh, they take you to shower. When they take you to shower, you're chained. You're chained. Uh, you're leg ironed, okay? And you're chained behind your back. And then they walk you to a shower, which is a cell, a small cell. So they take your... You get in there and you, there's a little slot. They take your handcuffs off, but they leave the chains on your ankle. And they left me there. One time they left me in there for about two and a half hours, cold water, running cold water for two and a half hours. And uh, stock cheap. And they just wanted to see, say, hey, curse them and try to go at them. And then the, another time they took me to the yard. And this was summer. This was August. August. Uh, <clears throat> 19, I think 80, 80, 88, 86, something like that, I can't remember. Took me to the yard, a little bullpen yard. Uh, no water, no shade. They left me out there for five hours in the, in, 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 in the heat, trying to get me to go off. So I, had to I did live with that for two months, two months, and it was not nice. It was not nice. And, uh, and don't ever believe that's a myth. When they say there's a full moon, people go off. But when there's a full moon in that criminal insane unit for two nights, that place went wild. Who was in there? All, all of them are crazy people. Who was in? But who were anybody, any proper psychopaths? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> one guy, when I was in there, they, I was actually looking at my standing there with the chain they have you got a little window in your cell and they got a tv facing north south east and west so you you with the chain you get to stand in front of the door and watch and watch the tv and then you got a little speaker in here so i'm watching it and they they drag a guy they drag him across the floor and his brains are leaking out of his head what he did this nut he wasn't in that unit. What he did is he hid up in the ceiling and he was clocking this nurse, clocking this nurse, and he jumped down and he beat her up and he raped her. Well, they, they, they legally killed them. They legally killed them. So this is what I had to spend the summer of 1985 in a criminally insane unit. What happened when you get out after the... Well, I went back to Marion. Yeah. And uh, the report showed nothing. Because I couldn't do anything because I don't know what they're up to in that jail. 
I'm, they're conspiring. They don't know who I am. They don't care about my case. All they care about, I was a marrying prisoner, and they abused me. They abused me. Beatings? Did you get beat up? I could have if you acted. You acted wrong. If you acted wrong. Who was in this prison with you? Who was in that prison? I, I there was in that cell block. There were probably about forty cells, <coughs> forty cells. But I didn't. I didn't know them. They were nuts. Everybody was crazy. What about when you went back to Marion? Yeah, and then one time in that same cell block, they had inside uh, cells in the cell block cages where you would keep a dog. And you went there and you did a little get out of the cell. You know, like I said, leg irons. They got a hole at the bottom of the door to take your leg irons off and then uh, behind you. And I'm in there and I'm, <clears throat> I got no chains on me. You know? It was just felt good not having a chain on me. And I'm working out, you know. Now they bring another guy to the right of me and another guy to the left, right? So I'm working out and I noticed the guy to the, on, yeah, be the right of me. He's everywhere I move, he's moving. I'm saying to myself, I said, What's the matter with you? He says, He's trying to shoot me. I said, What are you talking about? The guy to the left, he made a zip gun. You know what a zip gun is? Back then, and they used to have these boom boxes in the regular population. So he got a hold of a aerial from a boom boom box and he made a zip gun. And they knew they're so ingenuity, they knew how to make uh, gunpowder. They use match heads and they get a coin and shape off the what calls that mineral on a coin like a nickel and, and they and they make gunpowder then they get rubber bands with a screw so he's got this thing cocked and he's trying to shoot this guy and i'm ducking i said jesus i ain't gonna holler for the guard right i'm just what am i they got i'm trying to work out they put me through two nuts so what happened he he said Dive down. So I dived down and pow, he hit the guy. He hit the guy in the shoulder. That was my wreck. <laughs> What's uh, when did you ever settle into your sentence where you thought, fuck this man, the way you just. Well, I beat it. I beat the whole sentence in uh, 88. Beat the whole sentence. And uh, I come back. Same, they wouldn't even keep me in Philadelphia. They kept me in New York Maximum Security Unit, 22-hour lockup. And who they put me in with John Gotti. <laughs> We're in 22-hour lockup. I knew him very well. You put a guy in with another guy, 22-hour lockup. You really get to know each other. And uh, so, but wind up, they go right back to the same judge, and he gives me life, no parole again. If they beat it. So how did you beat her? The first time I beat it on a technicality. I found there was a technicality. So I beat that. And he gave it to me again. I'm the first person ever in the history of America. So did you get out? No, I didn't get out. So when you beat her, you, what happened? You, I still didn't make bail. I just got the sentence vacated. To they, what? They dragged me back to in front of the judge. And I got the life no parole again. So did they bring your sentence down when you beat her? Same judge. But see, when you beat it, what happened? Did they bring your sentence down? No. Gave so, me life, no parole again. But what did you beat then? Nothing. I beat the first life, no parole. <clears throat> sentence was, sentence was uh, vacated, but I was still guilty. He's guilty and then there's sentencing. It's two, two phases. Mm -hmm. So I was still guilty. If, and so I had to go back in front of the judge. And he gave me life, no parole again. Never happened ever in the history of America. So you beat that where you got... The sentence took, and then it took but me, you got to go Then it took the second life, no parole. Took me over almost over three decades to beat that. So you've got life without parole again. Right. And then what, what, what goes on when you go back to prison? When I got the life, no parole the second time, I had to go back to Marion. Now, so it's like five years I'm in lockdown. And I was there about another six months and they sent me to Leavenworth Penitentiary. It's a very infamous in Kansas, Leavenworth, Kansas. He's in a lot of movies and this and that. But when I first, after five years in the box, when I first got to a regular prison, I felt like I was free. I felt like I was free. I can go to the yard, I can go to the chow hall, I can go to commissary, I can go to the movies. 
and uh, and the Kansas City mob had the had the joint. I mean, Leavenworth. I liked it there so much that when they tried to transfer me, I told the the unit manager bury my paperwork. He buried my paperwork, so I didn't want to leave. That's how good good we had it there. Uh -huh. What was John Gotti like? Great man, uh, very astute man. He read he read books that were amazing. Didn't read any fiction, things like that. I just very very smart man. Uh, and we came very very close, and it went, he beat the first Rico. He beat that. What is Rico for people who don't know it yet? People Rico is a is a, which usually for mob cases, big mob cases. Uh, Rico is a. Many different things. It could be extortion. It could be drugs. It could be gambling. It could be murders. It's a combination. Rico is a combination of crimes. It's a combination of crimes. And my my case was even worse than a Rico. They had what you call 848, continual criminal enterprise. It's even worse than a Rico. Yeah. So see, when Gotti was in prison, did they still have that power in prison as they did when he was out? He was still boss. Was he? He was still boss, and then he beat that case. He beat that case. So you moved prison, you liked that prison. How long were you into your sentence then? When I get to Leavenworth? Yeah. Oh, I don't know, about six years. Uh, finally, like I said, I finally, I, I never, you know, I'm, all I did in, in marrying was jog in place, you know, push-ups. You know, Leavenworth's got a big yard, and... uh I just felt like I was still in prison, but I felt much more freer. I never forget the first time uh, my property didn't hit yet because your property follows you. It takes maybe about a week. Uh, they box box up box up what you had, and they ship it to your jail. But I didn't get my my boxes back then. But I wanted to go to the yard. You know, I want to run. You know, first time I ran other than a small cell. So I borrowed a pair of sneakers from a buddy that I knew. And uh, I went to the yard, and I'm running, and I notice these Indians started coming, one, two. And it was like 40, 50 Indians running behind me, and they all they got feathers and they're howling this and that, and I'm running faster. Now the Indians know that I'm new meat; they don't know that I know it's a. It was actually a holiday for India. It was a ceremony. It was a run. They run. They run the whole day. They don't stop. It, it, new Indians would come in, but they keep the run going the whole day. I don't know. So I'm in front of the pack, and I'm running. My oh, Jesus Christ! What are these, what are these Indians all chasing me? So in prison penitentiaries, you can move every hour on the hour. They'll open up the gate. You can go back to the cell block. But now I know I got to run this whole hour because he's, I don't know the Indians are running from early in the morning to the late, to like 8.30 at night. They, it's a ceremony. They keep running. So these Indians are chasing me. And when finally the gate opened up, I ran in. And, and I told my buddy, he said, them Indians were chasing me. He said, no, they ain't chasing you. It's a ceremony that they do. And I, you know, I said that your food was good, that, I finally got to see my family in a, a normal visiting a setting. You know, marrying was terrible. It was all behind glass. And you're, you're talking to your family and you're in chains. Mm -hmm. So. Did you ever think of giving up? Nah. Never <clears throat> entered my mind. Never entered my <coughs> mind. Never. You're a fucking strong guy, George. Well, you had to. It was either, either you did it or you die. Mm-hmm. You know, you, I seen situations where guys would lose their appeals, and uh, they get on that bunk. Uh, yes, we're in solitary, and they, I, I seen guys their skin get scaly, they get grayish looking. You know, matter of fact, when I got up, and when I did all those years in solitary, I after I had my breakfast, you know, brush my teeth, I get my mattress, and I had two pieces of sheet like a lasso, and I would fold my mattress and tie it up to a chair, and then I'd put the mattress against the wall, and I'd sit in the wall. And the only time I would, after dinner, I would put it back. And I used to tell other guy, get off that bunk. Get off that bunk. You can't rely on that bunk 24-7.
You had to get off the bunk. Where did you go to next? Where was your next prison? All the worst, Leavenworth, Lewisburg, Atlanta, Bloody Beaumont. Uh, when I first went to jail, the Bureau of Prisons, uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, transported by uh, bus. I've been across the country two, three times by bus. That means every night, every night you pull up to another jail. And then the years went by, and they went into uh, prop transport, DC-6s. They were using some DC-6s to transport prisoners. Now today they have about six jets. And any given day in America, there's six jets flying with prisoners. Any given day, from Monday through Friday. And uh, you, ever, you know the movie with uh, Nicolas Cage, Con Air? Well, you ever yeah. see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're, Great movie. you're talking to the real Con Air. You can see you've got to Google uh, uh, George Monterano handcuff key. I'm on a transport. And uh, when you travel, when you, if, I, now I'm a convict. You know, I know what to do every, when you travel and you're not traveling. I know how to, I know how to take care of myself. And, uh, Matter of fact, I get—I don't like anybody to call me an inmate. I'm a convict. And, What's the uh, difference? Big difference. Convict is a convict code. You, you live or die by it. Anyway, uh, I'm in the air. And before I would fly, you get an idea you're going to be leaving. And I stay up all night and I do push-ups, you know, jog in place, get real tired. So when I get on a plane, you could be on a plane 8 to 12 hours. You sleep. You stay up with your night. So I'm sleeping on a plane, towards the back of the plane. And you got your handcuff and you got leg irons. And I feel something around my feet. And I look down. I thought it was a pen. And a couple of buddies of mine I knew from New York, they said some they're trying to get who, who they're trying to get something under your feet. I said, oh, and there was there was three Samayan pirates behind me. They didn't understand a word of English. They all got life sentences. And I see this foot. It slipped off his bus sneakers and his toes were trying to. I thought it was a pen. Then I realized it was a handcuff key. It was called speed handcuff keys. They're about three inches long. They have a rubber end. And it un not only unlocks your handcuffs, it unlocks your leg arms. Because they can't use two different keys when they're loading you up. So... And if you hold that key, if you hold that key, you will be killed. You will be killed because in the air you have you have marshals with the they have the computerized guns. You know, they hit the numbers and the gun comes out, and it has the blazer beam. And they're experts at shooting on a crowded plane. They would have killed me if you're holding that plane. Whether you're trying to do the right thing with it or the wrong thing, you're going to be killed. So I noticed, these Samayan guys don't notice. And they want this key. I said, they're going to get us killed. Whoever's near that key or holding that key, you're going to be killed. So I said, oh, look at this. Why? The plane plane had maybe 200 guys on it. Why did that key have to fall under my foot? You know? I'm saying, oh, my gosh. I don't know what to do. And these guys are adamant. I told them, I'm says, you can't, you, there's no way they're going to let you come out of handcuffs and leg guards in a prison transport over America. There's no way in the world. And on a prison transport plane, you know, when you fly regularly, the door into the cabin where the pilots, he's got a door. Well, on prison transport plane, they have two doors. They have a door here and you got a guard sitting here in that space before you get to the door with the pilots. There's no way you, 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 you're going to get take control of this plane. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I got the key, and I lucked out. I flip it, and it went into a groove. You know, the aisles are thin. Mm -hmm. Now I fall right into a groove. I don't want these nuts getting this key. So fell, and... I grabbed the marshal. I says, hey, you dropped your key. Well, guess what? Guess who got the worst end out of it? Yeah. Me. They came, took me up in front of the plane, 
and they got this thing. I got this rel. It's like a, a vel velcro roll roll. They put the velcro on the seat. It catches, and then they wrap you. So you're sitting like this. You're all wrapped, <laughs> and then they put a hood over you. <clears throat> hood. So I had to stay that way for hours. I said, no sense trying to talk my way out of this because I'm in proceeds protocol now. There's a protocol on me, right? And I land. Guess who's there waiting for me when I land? The FBI. They take me to a little jail in the middle of Oklahoma, throw me in a boxcar cell, steel cell. I ain't saying nothing. I figured they'll, my two buddies, when I, I figured they're going to tell the story what happened. So I waited about two days, and then the, uh, uh, not the FBI, the marshals came, get me, put me back, back on the plane. So I said, well, where's the report? Where's the report that I did the right thing by that uh, handcuff key? Where's the report? Oh, it's in your traveling jacket. When you travel, you have a little file. It's your traveling jacket. It's in your traveling jacket. I said, sorry, because I'm going to use that to try to go back to court. I saved a hijacking. You know how long it took me to get that report? Four years. The, the air marshal who dropped the key, he would get fired. So they buried it, the paperwork, till he, he retired. Then once he got his retirement, they couldn't do nothing. It took me four years to get the report. See, when you were in prison as well, why would they put John Gotti in with a guy like you as well? Why would you not have separate cells? Would the cells have been, would they have been bugged, I'd imagine? No, MCC New York on the maximum security floor was two to a cell unless you're in. The, now, maximum security floor. Was, would the cells have been bugged? Even, even Yeah, they could bug them. Yeah. Even though it's 22 hour lockup. But on that same floor is a hole. It's called behind the glass. It's real thick glass. And when they throw you in the hole, you're by yourself, but when you're on the tier, tiers, you're, you're two in a cell. And we had the biggest cases in the city at that time. We had the mob commission case, we had the, all the mob bosses, all the underbosses of the New York families. We had that case. You had the, uh, excuse me, the Machacheros. Big case. They were freedom fighters. They tried to take over the Puerto Rican government. They fought the government. That was another big case. We had what you call the New York Eight. Uh, guys were robbing Brinks trucks. Black guys were robbing Brink trucks. And then you had the Ohio Seven. They were robbing Brinks trucks in Ohio. You had the biggest serious cases on that floor. And uh, and then, but like I said, the, that's the way you lived. That's the way you lived. Where did you go after the airplane heist? Well, what prison? That jail. Back I was headed back to. Uh, Jeez, that was that jail. I think Texas, Bloody Beaumont, Texas. Not, is that when you went after? Not the, nice, Bloody. The bloody airplane Beaumont. hijacking kind of thing. Is that where you went? I, yeah, when I finally mm -hmm. Texas I finally brought. They did. They took me out of the little county jail in a hole. Bring me back to the transport center. Transport center planes are coming in and out every day. It's in Oklahoma, and it holds a thousand guys. And they took me there and. Uh, Maybe more than a thousand. I just wait there till I catch my plane going to Texas. A thousand inmates on a plane? No, no. Uh, that building hold about oh, maybe a building. maybe that building hold about two thousand. But that was the hub for the planes going in and out. You know, because you got prisoners going to the West Coast, you got prisoners going to the East Coast, you got prisoners going to Louisiana, Florida, you got prisoners going up north to Minnesota. So there's prisoners are going everywhere, everywhere. So what where did, what prison? What what's the worst prison you have been in, George? Well, Marion was not nice, but the worst pr worst time I ever did was in the criminally insane unit. That was man, that, that was hard. That was hard time. What's hard. the worst thing you have seen in prison? Oh, I lost count. Lost count. I had to live. I had to live with some. I had to live in a cell with a dead guy for two days. I'm in the transit in Atlanta Penitentiary and. I'm trying to get out of there. You, when you're in transit, you can stay 24 hours or the max is 19 days. So, but I know how to get word when I'm going out. I knew where every, I was very well known in the prison system everywhere I went. And I knew I was leaving Monday morning. 
So I got in that cell, I think it was Friday, and the guy died, took a heart attack. I said, oh, no. Now, a guy, if you're in a cell with a guy and he dies, the- you're, going lo- you're going to get locked up for investigation. <laughs> Whether it's medical issue or you, somebody killed him, you're going to go to hold for investigation. So I don't want to go to hold, but then I ain't going to get out of here. I'm going to be stuck here a couple months. So what I did with the dead guy, and uh, I, I leaned, I put him on the bottom bunk, I leaned him up, and it just so happens, there was a pair of glasses he had. He had tinted glasses. They were reading glasses, they were tinted. So I put him on the glass. So you count, in prison you count, you had you have the four o'clock count, and you had the 12 o'clock count. And the guard comes by, at night comes the flashlight. As long as he sees two people in it. So, you know, now I got to food trays. I make sure I flush his food, you know, make sure he showed that he's eating this and that. So so now I get, I, I'm two days in the cell with a dead guy. So now I get transferred. When I hit the jail, I was gone, right? They take me. Guards come and take me right to the psychiatrist's office, right? And the, the psychiatrist, me and him became, got the, became friends. He says, Mark Toronto, did you live with a dead guy in the cell for a, a long period of time? I says, no. He said, well, well, I have a report that you, from Atlanta Penitentiary, that you were in a cell with a dead guy. I said, how did he die? He said, he died of natural causes. I said, oh, I told, I was, the guy I was with, I talked to him all day. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of times when the guard would go, when he would feed, I'd be talking to the guy. <laughs> you know? When the guy would feed, the guard would feed. No wonder they put you in the fucking loony bin, George. <laughs> no wonder. You, no wonder so, you. Yeah, so the guy says, you had to, you live with a dead I said, not me. I don't live with a dead guy. What happened after that? No, I went back to but rather I went back to the regular cell block. So you never got investigated for that? Nah, because like I said, they figured I'm nuts and I'm denying it. That guy was not dead when I was with him. What happens then after that? What what prison did you go to then? That that jail I went to uh, called Coleman Penitentiary in Florida. What was that like? That's another but they, right now, uh all across America, the pen- federal penitentiaries are worse than the states. All across America, they're killing fields. Right now, penitentiaries are gang, run by gangs, and they're killing fields. You got, most jails have anywhere from 1,800 to 2,200 guys. Well, you got 70% gangs. So, and the lockdown, they're locked down six months out of the year. So guy gets killed, riots go off. And they, uh, you know, you're locked down. So even though I did five years in solitary and then all those years, the worst penitentiaries, I must have did another five years and periodically lockdowns. But it didn't bother me because I did five years of that. It didn't bother me. Was there any prison riots? Oh, till today. If you invite me to a concert, I don't go. You invite me to see top basketball game, football game. I got friends that have boxes, the Eagles uh, stadium, the Sixers stadium. I don't go because I have a phobia about crowds. I've been in three bad prison riots, three bad so prison riots. So I don't like all those people around me. And you better know what you're doing in a prison riot to survive. You better know what you're doing. How do you survive? You bet you in a prison riot, you, you, you find yourself a corner back to the wall. You know what I mean? And, uh, but the, even though the prison riots is bad, it's when the goon squads come in, them cops come in, these special, they're called the uh, short teams. When these short teams come in, they, you better know what you're doing. You have to get t- to the wall and face the corner, face the wall, lie down and face that wall. If you're standing and you're not facing that wall, they're going to split your head open. I mean, split it wide open. It was one riot. We were in uh, uh, Leavenworth. It was a bad riot. And uh, after the riot, there was, I think, 40 guys stabbed, three dead. 
because all the old blood comes out in a riot. The guys who go get guys, they've been wanting to get this guy. So, uh, like I said, I don't go to crowds. Who runs the prisons, George? What gangs? Different gangs. <clears throat> you have the you have the Aryan Brotherhood. Right now, they're mostly Central American gangs. You know, the faces all tattooed up. Don't never been to school. All they care about in prison is drugs, uh, uh, making wine, uh, gambling. But like I said, I have a river of stories. Uh, that's why I try to. I'm trying to find the right producer to do my TV series. Now, some experts feel that it's going to be a long-running TV series. You can go 10 years. You can go 10 years, my stories. 10 years. So I'm trying to develop that. Was there a time, when did you, so you, your life without parole, was that what you got? Yeah. So are you just preparing to then, die in prison or did you always have a fight? Life parole means you die. Did you always feel as if you had a fighting chance though to get out? You keep fighting. So you, I, I, I'm the most appealed federal prisoner to today in America. How many appeals? 32 appeals. In what prison did you stay in the longest? Oh, I lost count. I lost count. Five years in this one, four years. I lost count. I lost count. Of all the, I can't even name all the prisons I've been at. How has it been round all the fucking psychopaths, the murderers, the serial killers? Well, one of my workout buddies, his name's Daryl Holmes. But I don't even think that's his name. He he killed three people by chopping their heads off in the Colorado system. It was in the Colorado system, state of Colorado. He killed an inmate, cut his head off. He killed a guard, cut his head off. But what made him... If you're a psychologist working in any federal prison in America, I don't know if they're still doing it, but back then, you had to read the dossier on Daryl Holmes. The reason you had to read, there was one prison psychiatrist in his jail in Florida. Uh, I think his name was Willis. Anytime he had a free free time, he would call loudspeaker, or tell Marcelano to report to my office. And all he wanted to talk about was Daryl Holmes. Because I knew him. He was my workout buddy. What he did this, Daryl Holmes, you know the movie uh, with John Voight, a runaway train? Mm -hmm. The movie starts with John Voight. They actually had him welded in the cell. Well, that story came from Daryl Holmes. They actually welded him in the cell in the Colorado system. And he peeled it because it was uh, inhumane treatment. And he won. And uh, they shipped him to Marion. And that's where I met him. He lived next to me. And Marion, uh, they crack, when you when you work out, they crack five cells at a time. So those five guys, you're going to get out. You're going to get your shower. We, we used to, you're only out an hour. We, we work out for about 30 minutes, quick shower, and get back in, you know. So he worked, lived next to me. So when he, the cells were cracked, uh, you know, we work out. And, uh, but I knew who knew who he was, and uh, oh, about about the how he cut the psychologist's head off. When he was in the Colorado system, the cell was welded. The psychologist was very connected. He didn't even work for the prison, but his family was very rich, and the governor gave him permission to to go to that prison and interview and study. Daryl Holmes, because Daryl Holmes has already cut two people's heads off. He caught a guard, sneaked up on a guard on the toilet, cut his head off. And uh, so uh, he gets permission from the governor to try to find out how Daryl Holmes ticked, what made him work. Daryl, when he came to the cell, he says, I'm having the cell, well, I'm welding the cell. I want to talk on an interview. Dal said to him one sentence, leave me alone. This guy didn't, didn't leave him alone. So he started, and in, in, in those maximum security jails, when you come out, even though you're in handcuffs and leg irons, you're called uh, guards hole. You can go from a 10 guard escort down to a two. When I was in Marion, I was on a four guard. Every time I came out that cell, say I had to go to the medical or dentist, I had four guards around me. 
four. And then it went down after I was there a while, it went down to two. Dow Holmes had 10 guards. When they took him from point A, point B, to the psychologist's office, and guess what? He was about five, Dow was about 5'10", five, 5'11", five, good-looking guy. He actually looked like the actor Peter O'Toole when he was young. Right? So takes him down to the psychiatrist's office, and he's talking to him. You know, this is a year. But in a year's time, it went from 10 men down to eight, six, four. So down when he finally got, because the psychiatrist said, no, just put two guys on him. When he got down to two guys, they're not in the office when you're being interviewed. They're, they're somewhere. And if they know the interview is long, they might go get lunch or something. So when they came back, you know what was on the desk? His head. His head. <clears throat> and you know what Daryl told the warden? He said, I told him to leave me alone. So, so now I, he's my workout buddy. And I had some friends on the cell block. I had, I don't know if you heard the MA, Mexican Mafia. They were my, the original guys, Black Bob, Champ. These were the original. And then you had the real Aryan Brotherhood. You had uh, Barry Mills. They did a big, big documentary on the Barry Mills. He ordered to, he ordered 40 guys killed over the years. Did you ever come across Michael Thompson? He was in the Aryan Brotherhood, but I think he became a snitch because of someone, kids were killed. I didn't know Thompson. <clears throat> I, knew, I knew Barry Mills. I knew T.D. Bingham. I knew a, a, a couple of the leaders around the other joints. Anyway, and uh, they wouldn't talk to me. They would whisper to me. I switched man. We don't want nothing to do with that guy. He, we don't want nothing to do with that guy. And... Uh, so now, and he was very, uh, he would train, he would put a blanket on the wall and he would do martial arts at Barry Mills. I'm not Barry, uh, Daryl Holmes. So how anyway. Did, how did they cut his head off? He, he told me it's, it's, he's, it's, it's, he said you had to have a towel and a knife. He says, because the front, all the blood gushes out. And he said, you got it. This is the intricate part, getting to the neck. <laughs> he says, you got to know how. This is, this is how he's talking. Anyway, the warden, like I told you before, a warden makes the rounds every cell block once a week. I don't care what prison you're at. That's his job. So, uh, you know, there's open bars. So the warden, uh, Dallas talking to the warden. He says, warden, I've been here over three years now. I haven't caused any trouble. Now, you're programming... Your programming states, if you're here three years and you're no problem, I'm eligible to be transferred. I want to go back to the Colorado system. And he says, if, you, I, I, if I'm not out of here in two weeks, the head's coming off. I'm telling you now, it could be your head. It could be somebody on his block. A guard, the head's coming off. Now, you can get your goon squad, and you can search every inch of this cell. You could, they had x-rays too. They take the inmate down x-rays, see if he had it nice up his ass or something, right? He said, you ain't going to find nothing, but I'm telling you, your head's coming off. So he, he leaves. So now, I ain't wrecked yet. We ain't wrecked yet. So I said, oh my God. So we, you know, we do burpees, you know, we know what burpees are, this and that. So we wreck, I got a towel around my neck i got a towel and he he looked he, i never had a towel tied around my neck he looked at me and he smiled he says george you're the only friend i ever had because i used to look out for him he's your head ain't going to come off don't worry <laughs> you you can take the towel off <laughs> so now that was how the fuck could you still trust the psychopath do you know what i mean so now the warden came back saturday morning this was friday afternoon <laughs> Word had come, come back Saturday morning. He's in this, he's not in a suit and tie. He's in leisure show, show. But the word never comes close to the bar. He's the good three, four feet from the bars. He knows better than that. He said, Daryl, no, he said, Holmes. Holmes, I talked to the governor of Colorado. I will have you out here in, within two weeks or under. Please do not do anything. I promise you. So he says, all right. All right, as long as you said I'm out of here in two weeks. And he was out of here in two weeks. Now, I don't know what they did to him when he went back to the 
to the Colorado uh, State Penitentiary. I don't know. Why was he not in a straitjacket? No, and Marion, uh, you, you, you're never going to be with a guard, near a guard in Marion. A guard is always on the other side of the bars. Now, when you, you have, in Marion, Illinois, you're only out of your cell 11 hours a week. Once a day for your shower, two hours inside rec and two hours outside rec. And there's only, uh, they take, there's 17 guys, the top tier, 17 guys, the bottom tier. But when you go to the yard, there might be three, four guys, but they tell you. Now, when you go to the yard, you're, every, every inmate is, is, is leg ironed and handcuffed behind the back and a, and a guard holds you and you go to the yard. And then the yard, they take it, take it all off. But they tell you, you're not coming in because they're not going to bring the whole all these guards to take all these guys back. Once you go out there, you ain't coming in. And I've been, you want to go outside. You want to get fresh air. So I would go to the yard and I put on my boots, my prison boots. And I remember one time, it was like probably zero degrees in Illinois. And I ran the whole, whole time, well, a little over two hours. I ran the whole time. And I, and I came back in. You know, you got this little tin mirror in your cell. I looked like Frosty the Stoneman. I had icicles all, all over me. But you wanted to get out, but you ain't coming in. If a guy drops dead out there, they'll leave him out there. They'll bring everybody in before they go uh, go get that guy. Was he one of the worst prisoners you had been in with? Nah, there was there was some, uh, like a guy named, uh, he was something else. Uh, what the hell was his name, uh? This guy was a mountain man from uh, Montana. Is that the guy you got the KFC and McDonald's? Is that? Yeah, that no, it was another mountain man. What was his name? Uh, great guy, real good guy. He, you know how he killed the guy? Uh, he was in another jail. He got a National Geographic and rolled it up, rolled it up, rolled it up like a comb, and he rolled it up real tight, and he hit him in the temple. With a National Geographic, he killed them. <laughs> so, you know, when you go, when you uh, at the front of the chair, there's always a box with books and magazines. You know, when you get your hour out, you go get a book. I always used to break his stones because he didn't come out the cell when I came. I only used to see him at the gym or the or the rec yard. I used to give him a magazine. <laughs> he said, so, so as he stopped fucking around, he used to say, <laughs> he killed the guy with a National Geographic. When did you start getting a bit of hope of getting out? How long into your sentence? I always had some trace of hope in me. I just kept <clears throat> filing. I, 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 did, I, did, I did something that had never been done before in the history of the federal system. I couldn't get any relief. In, in this country, you have circuits. Every state has the circuits that you're under. These least two to three states come under one circuit, and you have circuits from one to ten. I'm in the third circuit. Appeals Court. So that's New Jersey, uh, Pennsylvania, Eastern Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. That's the third circuit. Second circuit is New York City and New York. So I had a kid working for me, black kid, uh, came uh, Holloway, John Holloway. And he used to help me. Incidentally, I, I, know, I graduated more inmate students than anybody ever in the history of America. I graduated over, over 8,000. That was a, one of the deciding factors upon my release. And my, which I'm very proud of in my curriculum that Washington approved that I can create my own curriculum. That means after they graduated my classes, it was keyed in their computer record. So I'm very proud of that. So uh, John Holloway, he would help me, you know, clean the blackboards, if I needed the copies, he would go to the office and make copies for the, my class. I never took a class over 25, always 25 or less, because you can't really teach them when it's too too many in the classroom. Anyway, so he had just lost a, an appeal. He's in 22 years. And this guy was in jail, a violent carjacker, twice. That's violent. Carjacking is violent. He said, I can't take it no more. I got my mother's sick. I got to get out. You got to help me get out. But, but, but. 
So I says, all right. I write a letter to his judge. His judge was was the prosecutor. What was the prosecutor? John Gotti's second prosecutor, I forget his name. Gleason, Judge Gleason, federal Judge Gleason. Tough judge. So I, I write a letter to this guy, one page letter. I'm a, I was a professional writer at the time. I wrote it, just tell him what, how the guy acts, how long I know the guy, what is he doing in prison. And I said, I don't believe he's going to go back to crime. I write this letter for him and we get the judges at you mail now. Normally, in the federal, in the federal judge's office, he has two clerks. Their their protocol is they're not going to hand a judge a letter. They're not even going to hand them because it's not it has no merit for court. In order for a judge to review any paperwork, it's called a docket number. You have to have a docket number. So I write this letter, and I know it ain't going nowhere. I figure, let me try to help. At least keep him quiet for a while. About six weeks later, he come running into the class with this paper. I looked at the paper. He got a docket number from Judge Gleason that's going to review the sentence. But the only thing that you could hang your hat on and relief that uh, Holloway's been languishing in prison and he had good conduct. He'd been, he, he's been a model prisoner. That's all I basically put. He wins. He wins. And I never forget when I walked him to, when you, when you leave a prison, it's called R&D, okay? The, the departure and receiving, uh, receiving and departure. So I walked him to R&D and I says, let me tell you something, John. If I hear you're catching a break of a lifetime, if I hear you're coming back, I don't care where jail you go, you better go to hold. Because I, I, my word can travel around this country. He went out there, did the right thing. Thank God he never came back. But he's in the second circuit. Okay? So now I'm laying in my bunk about a month later, and I'm saying to myself, I created case law in the second circuit. I'm going to put it in the third circuit to my judge. And just the story I told you just now about John Holloway, that's just how I told the judge. The story about how I got John Holloway out of jail. Letters on my desk, got a little still desk in a cell. It's there. I never mailed it. Sitting there like a week, 10 days. It's got coffee stains on it. Finally, a buddy of mine, he says, when are you going to mail that letter? I said, all right, give me a stamp. I got a stamp. He lived down on the flats. I'm on the second tier. Now, the mailbox is downstairs. I said, right, listen, before you lock in, Throw it in the mailbox. Didn't think nothing of it. <laughs> sure enough, I'm in the yard working out. I hear a loudspeaker, Mark Toronto, port to the warden's office. Mark Toronto, port to the warden's office. I said, oh, no. Nah. It's nothing bad. I figured he wants me to do something else, you know, with teaching or something. So uh, I go to, he says, what? he said, your lawyer's been calling, trying to get you. Sums up. He said, push the phone right to me. He said, call him. So I called him. My lawyer says, you got a docket number. You got a docket number on the, on the Holloway. But the reason, like I said, I don't want to bother the audience with legality, legal talk. The reason I got the docket number is when I lost my, <clears throat> one of my appeals four years prior, I had lost an appeal. And I had the biggest lawyers in the country, Roy Back. Roy Black, Theodore Simon. Theodore Simon got the Amanda Knox out of Italy. He beat that case. You know, the girl, they said to Amanda Knox that she cut a guy's throat in, in Rome or something. And another, Marsha Silver. So I had the three, one of the three biggest lawyers in the country. So now I lost. I had lost four years ago. And I gave them all the money I had left in, in the world at that time, which is which a substantial amount of money. Anyway, uh, I says, listen, if I lose this, Oh, you're not going to. Yeah, I said, I've been hearing that for close to 30 years now. <clears throat> if I lose this, do not withdraw as attorney of record. That means when the judge wants to look at your file, she'll tell the clerk, does he have attorney of record? By me doing that, that's what got me the docket number. Because I'm not John Holloway, I'm George Martorano. I made newspapers all over the country. 
okay? And by me telling him, do not withdraw from the case, the judge says, does he still have the lawyer? She's just, her, his, was he or she, the clerk says, yes, she does. It was a woman judge. Yes, she does, Your Honor. And that's how I get back. And now, once I got accepted with a docket number, it took me 10 months to walk out. How, so that was after 32 years? Yeah, it took me 10. No, it's still, we're, we're coming close to 32 years. <clears throat> so this is 31 years, you've got a docket right, number. Right, we're coming close to 32 years. So uh, the judge told the U.S. attorney, his papers are not leaving my desk. In other words, when a judge says, that means your file, that motion is still going to be considered. She says, that, that motion's on my desk. You better find a way to release Mark Toronto. And they kept saying, he's too well known. If we release him under the Holloway standard, where you've been languishing in prison and you had good conduct, it would affect a lot of, lot of inmates. It'll be a floodgate. It will not only be a floodgate in the Third Circuit, it would go around to the other circuits. And you think they would be humane enough to say, well, you know, he did all that time. So now they're trying to figure out how to get me out. It's 10 months. So are my lawyers on top of everything? And uh, the U.S. attorney says, we just need something more. And my lawyer said, what do you need more? He has the most pristine prison record ever of a federal prisoner. What, what more do you need? Well, we just need something more. So he's telling me this. I said, what can I do? What can I do? Maybe I'm looking at it differently. I'm doing everything intelligently, law, you know. I said, maybe I'll go in a different way. It just so happens. Uh, I used to work out early in the yard before uh, uh, my, start my classes. I'm, as soon as the yard opened up. And I, was, I, didn't, I, I always wanted to be by myself. And I noticed this bench. It was this, uh, I don't know what kind of metal it was. It was getting pieces cut out of it. You know, inmates are very ingenuity. They know how to make this string to cut metal. And they cut and chop. I knew right away, it's a knife maker. They're making, this guy's making knives. And it was ready, two gangs were ready to go at it. Two Spanish gangs were ready to go at it. So I knew, the, I tracked the guy down. I knew the guy, he was a junkie. He's making the knife so he can, some of, the, some of them people in jail got a hundred day habit. You know, they, they're shooting at, at that time, they were shooting up, called a Sapoxin. They were shooting that up in jail. So I says, listen, how many knives you got? He had an old puller case. I said, give me them nice, I'll pay you. And, and jail stamps his money. I think I gave him like five, $600 in stamps, right? So now I got the bag. I just so how I lucked out a lieutenant that I knew when he started as a guard. I know this lieutenant, he was getting close to retirement. Great guy. I says, listen, but he, he was morning watch officer. That means... He has complete control of the prison from 12 at night to 8 in the morning. He's, he's like the warden. So I says, listen, here's these knives. Make me up a good report. He says, I said, but they, they're going to go to war, but they ain't going to be killing each other, right? So he took pictures of it. He made it. I didn't give a name, though. I wouldn't give a name. He made this report. Sure enough, the next day they went to war. They, I mean, they went at it. They were hitting each other, but... Uh, locks and socks, but they weren't stabbing each other, okay? And so much so, they they let were locked in two weeks, let us out, they want the war again. But not if it wasn't for Mark Toronto, we'd have dead prisoners and dead guards. Now, finally, finally the government says, now, nah, now nah, we're going to let them out. What was that feeling? They said, now, nah, well, wait a minute. This is how crazy this government is. They told my lawyer to report to the U.S. Attorney's Office to say we're going to go and we're going to release him. My lawyer goes in there and my lawyer's probably one of the... He's not only an American lawyer, he's an international lawyer. He's a famous international lawyer. He walked in there, he said, George, I couldn't believe it. He said, head of the FBI, Philadelphia FBI, head of the U.S. Attorney's Office, Philly, head of... Uh, DEA, Philly, head of the Homicide Division, City. I don't know who else was in that room. They would not put 
in order for you to release, there must be a signature asking for your release. No one would sign. They wanted joint signatures. After doing 32 plus years, this is still the scrutinization that I had to outsmart. So I, okay, now I never forget. It was, I got out October 5th, 2015. It was, let me see. It was the second. It was a Friday. And again, uh, Marcherano, report to the warden's office. Report to the warden's office. I go, they said, what's the matter? your lawyer's been calling here. Gives me the phone again. Dial my lawyer. <laughs> the first thing he says, are you sitting down? I says, no, I ain't sitting down. Oh, I said, I got something to tell you. I said, tell me what? He says, you're, you're at least going to be on the 5th. You're being released on the 5th. So now it's the 2nd. I says, okay. He says, you hear what I just told you? He's screaming, you're going to be out. I says, okay. When I'm all, when I'm out of the prison, I'm out. Because I ain't letting nothing, nothing get to me, you know? So, uh, so now I know I'm going home Monday. And this so happens the law came down, a recent law, that you can get your sentence cut if you had this certain thing. And I did a lot of motions for guys. And I had two old timers. Uh, they didn't put their motions in. One was Vic, uh, Vic Arena and another old guy. These are mob guys. And they kept procrastinating bringing me their papers. So I know I'm getting out uh, Monday. So what did I do all weekend? I'm preparing motions. I don't want to leave these guys hanging. At these two old timers. So I finally in prison it's to make get things typed up, to make copies, you have to put it in a certain envelope and the and the legal mailbox, you know. So I had to do all this. I ain't still ain't thinking about myself. So finally I get it all done Sunday. I said, Oh, now I can relax. I get my buddy, we'll go to the yard, uh, we'll get some uh, moonshine. They make moonshine, clear moonshine in prison, I have a couple of drinks. So I'm, I'm, I'm going up, I'm going to my room to get stuff for the yard. I get, George, the gay community's out front. I said, what? <laughs> so I go out there and it's the gay community. It just so happens, this was 2015, there was some big movement around the country with gays, fav favorable movement. And I said, what do you want? They said, we want a gay day in the yard. So I figure I know what the answer. I said, listen, I'll go to the warden, but you have to write it down. What are you going to do? Do you want amusement? Are you going to bring soda? You know, stuff like that. You have to write everything down. And then I'll bring it to the warden. I figured, I ain't going to see these guys until I'm out of here. Guess what? They were there, they were there that night <laughs> with the paper. So the next morning, I go to the lieutenant. I said, they, they said, George, you're going home. What are you doing? They said, you're going home. I said, what, what, what can I do? I said, they want to have, just, just approve it. So I, I was doing deeds. Then I finally, finally get out uh, in the morning, uh, October 5th. And I had my lawyer there. I had two of my sisters. And that's the first time I held cell, cell phones. So I had uh, headed back to St. Pete, Florida. I did my acclamation to freedom. Say, I'm riding in the car with two cell phones. Talking to everybody in the world. Never held a cell phone. What was that feeling then, George? 32 years I got ago. car sick. <laughs> I ain't been in a car. <laughs> I always been in planes and buses. I ain't been in a car. And I'm in the back of a car. But I'm not showing that I'm, I'm feeling sick. So we finally get in front of the house. And all my family's here. My mother's been cooking for days and this and that. And the first thing, I said, everybody go inside. I want to talk to the lawyer. The first thing I did is I ran behind a bush. And uh, I was car sick. Could that have been nerves though as well after so long that yeah. they could have been waiting outside for an, with another so, charge? Anyway, we had a great three days eating, drink, the whole family. The house was full. So about about four days, which I ain't been out yet. You know, I haven't been with a girl, this and that. So I figured it's time, time to go out, right? <laughs> and I always was a good dresser, you know. So my sister bought me some clothes that she figured. So I... I go, this is St. Pete, Florida. <laughs> I go downtown St. Pete. Beautiful. Beautiful. 
downtown St. Pete. And I'm hanging out. I'm, ha I'm having a good time. And, uh, and I'm getting late because, you know, I was up and I, and I ran. And uh, I said, where can I get a cab? They said, oh, just go to the corner of the park. That's where all the Ubers are. You get the Ubers, and there's if there's not a cab, there's Ubers. Should I go there? I don't see a cab. I see a couple limos, you know, and I bang on the whim. I say, hey, are you Uber? The guy's looking at him like crazy. I didn't know Uber was an app. I thought I was looking for a guy named Uber. <laughs> finally, one, finally, one guy, he says, where you been? I said, I've been in jail. He says, Uber's not a person. It's an app. I said, what's an app? <laughs> Oh, let's get, so finally, I was booked right away as a speaker uh, around the country. And I was, I got booked right away, St. Pete, Florida. I'm not even home a week in front of a big audience talking about like I'm talking now. And uh, it was a blonde in the crowd, right? And she's looking at me and I'm looking at her. So we wind up getting together. And uh, just so happens, uh, my niece had a beautiful house at a place called Golfport. And she was on vacation with her family, but she gave me the code to the how to get in the house. She said, oh, George, you want to go enjoy yourself there? So I take the girl, the blonde, uh, to the house. And uh, I wanted to do something special. I don't just didn't want to jump in a bed, this and that. And, you know, I'm drinking. I haven't drank in a long, long time. And... My niece had a cute little tree house in the back. So I, me and the girl go up in the tree, tree house and we make love, right? I guess I was a little too frisky because she fell out. And it was about, I say, about eight, eight feet high. She fell out. Boom. And I'm looking there. I'm naked. She's naked. She's laying there. And I'm saying to myself, Oh my God, I'm only out of jail, not even a week. I got a dead girl at the bottom. Of the, so I'm saying to myself, what, what am I gonna do? I got my niece, my niece is gonna get in trouble. So I'm saying, well, I said, I think I seen a rowboat. I figured I put on a rowboat and dump her somewhere. What was I gonna do? You know, I, all these things are going through my mind. And then some somebody whispered, my kind said, go down and see if she's alive. <laughs> I calmed down. Sure enough, she was alive. She just was knocked out. So I went and got the hose, put a little water on it. She woke up. Guess what she did? She climbed right back up. <laughs> that was my first romance. <laughs> <laughs> so what's that feeling then, George? 32 years in prison. You've missed your kids growing up. You've missed the love from your That's, mother. Whatever they did to me, I, I took. But the hurt that I gave to my children, that's... That's uh, what bothers me the most, my children. You know, I lost, I lost a boy. I usually don't talk about that, but he seemed like a great guy. I lost a boy in the, in the 201 Sorry, yeah. motorcycle accident. Very handsome, good kid, very handsome boy, motorcycle. Yeah, sorry to hear that. Yeah. Does part of you then become anti-authority because the way you treated you, the things that you've messed up, you could have possibly saved your son's life as well. Like if the... I was home, my son would be alive, my father would be alive. So I have to live there. I lost my father in two oh two. He got ambushed. Ambushed and killed in two oh two. So you... I have to live with and I mourned them in the cell. I mourned my wife in the cell in two thousand. I mourned my cell uh, my son in the cell two oh one and I mourned my father two oh two. I have a saying, it's called right hands. I got hit with three right hands in a row. And uh, when I lost my boy, I was in a bad joint, bloody Beaumont, bad joint. And uh, I went to a hillbilly friend of mine. I said, go give me a half gallon of moonshine. And uh, I took it in my cell, put it right on my, my table. You're not allowed to have that. You can go to hold for that. And then I put another buddy out front of my cell. I says, don't let nobody come in this cell. Because after I kill him, I'm going to come out and kill you. Because I'm, I'm out of it. I lost my son. And all I did, the yard opened up at 6 o'clock. I ran from 6 to 8.30, okay? 6 to 8.30, drinking. The yard would open at night, ran again. I was running probably five, six hours a day. So I just could sleep. That's how I mourn. What are you going to do? You have to mourn. A human has to mourn. Were you ever suicidal, George? Were you ever suicidal? No, no, never. 
You seem too strong for that. Never, never. I, but you, I, you, did you see a lot in there, men taking their own life? I lost count of many guys' suicide. I seen a guy. He, what he did, this guy, I was talking to him. He was depressed. He had just lost an appeal. And I told him there's other avenues, you know. He thought it was a direct appeal, but there's other ways you can get into court. He thought by losing his first appeal, direct appeal, it was all over. What he did, he tied his feet. You know, this is a bunk. The bunk's only, what, two feet off the ground. He tied his feet to one end of the bunk. He tied his neck to the other end of the bunk, and he just rolled over. That's, a, that's how he hung himself. He just rolled over. Yeah. Do, do you get emotional much when you're doing big sentences like that, or do you become stone cold? You can. You can. I've seen uh, the worst thing you can do Oh, no, do I think the one of the worst things that you can is look at dead eyes. In Marion, I there was individuals; their eyes were dead, nothing, no emotion. They were dead eyes. I said uh, once once you get that state mentally, there's no telling what you can do in a violent sense. So you get out. You've seen your family. You've seen your mum. How's life then? Well, everything was strange. Everything cost more. <laughs> I know that. And uh, it's just everything was different. Every Everything was different. How do you adjust? You just keep going, working out, keeping busy. I keep busy. I keep very, very busy. That's mm. the most, what I do in my life. I just keep busy. Did you get therapy or anything? Shows like this, it's all I do. <laughs> Shows like this. So you've also... I haven't read, I written many works. As a writer, we call it works, plural. I've written many works, but I have never written my life story yet. Uh -huh. I, 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 I'm, I'm not financially where I can take off months and do that. Right now, I have businesses. I do a lot of filming, uh, but I haven't done any writing, and I love to write. So you've written 32 books as well, and you helped 8,000 8, kids get... I graduated over 8,000 inmates. And you've written 32 books, is that correct? Well, not all books, manuscripts, shorts, uh, uh, scripts for movies, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, and the stage plays, and a lot of short stories. I taught creative. One of my classes was creative writing, and that class was always full creative writing. And some of my students went on to be successful writers. So, how's it been since the last eight years? Eight years you've been out now, yeah. two thousand fifteen. Like I said, when I first met you, it's one step forward, two steps back. Mm. One month I got money, the next <clears throat> month I'm looking for money. D did you get out for your dad's funeral? No, they won't let you do that. Because you're so high risk? You got to be at a camp. You're not going to any funeral behind a wall. No way in the world. So how have you handled being out? Fast paced world? I keep funeral? busy, uh, James. I keep busy. I'm bi coastal now. I live in Philly and Las Vegas. I have a sister there, and I'm creating some businesses there. There's a there's a facility called the Mob Museum, which I'm affiliated. It's been there about 11 years. Does very well. It's a very famous place. I'll be doing a podcast out of there starting April, and uh, so I'm developing stuff in Jersey and Philly and, and Vegas. How do you then? Enjoy your life now. Just try. Well, I'm gonna come and see you in Scotland anytime, brother. You're I'm a coming. fucking. You've got. A, you're a fucking great storyteller. You look the part. If if, if good, you'd be you'd be a great part in Goodfellas. Yeah. Well, I knew. I knew the guy Robert De Niro played hey, Jimmy. In Gofo, and he was a friend of mine. Yeah. And my nice guy, I did time with him. And in, in uh, matter of fact, I was in Lewisburg when Henry Hill. Went and ratted on him for the body, and then they took him out. They took, they came, and took him out. And but Jimmy knew he was going out, and we had a nice little party for him in the back of the library, uh, in Lewisburg. The, uh, the the mob controlled the library. The mob guys in the back of it. We had like place where we could have some cake and coffee, and we had his party back there. And he wound up going to court in New York, and he got twenty five to life on that Henry Hill. What's your biggest regret, George? Uh, my children, again. Um, my ch I hurt my children more than I can imagine because as a child, I went away, they were children. 
And I imagine the uh, children tease children, you know. So if I could do it all over again, I would never do it. I would not, I, you know, you're younger, you don't think right, you wanted to make a lot of money. And I would have looked at it all differently for my children's sake. What's the biggest life lesson that you've learned? Biggest le life lesson that I've learned is that uh, go legit. <laughs> be, le be legit. All these young people out there that are out there. There's plenty, plenty of ways that you can get educated and uh, being uh, using your hands or your mind. Be, I do a lot of public speaking. There's some schools that I go. I won't take. I won't go and talk to the classes that are all A students. I want to go talk to the trouble kids. So I do a lot of that. I still do do a lot of that. What do you think is the missing ingredient for people who are in prison all the time and reoffend over eighty percent of the time? What do you think it is it's missing in these kids' well, lives? Well, a lot's got to do with your state and the federal government. They're not doing enough. They're not doing it. As a matter of fact. We just got a new mayor in Philadelphia. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with her next week because I've been trying, I've been going around the country now for four years on all these troubled cities trying to Im implement a cannabis for guns program. In other words, we'll take the gun from you, no questions asked, and we'll give you marijuana. These kids, first of all, these kids are street smart. You ain't giving them a hundred dollars or a gift certificate to targets, or whatever for their gun. These kids, they ain't doing it. But if you give them the right amount of marijuana, they have to be 21, but if the kid's 15, he's got a gun, he'll go get his aunt or his uncle or somebody, 21, turn in the gun, and we give them the marijuana. I think that program could really work, make a big deterrent difference in America. Where do you go forward for the future, George? Well, I'm going to stay with the entertainment right now. I mean, I have my cannabis company. It's uh, we we kick it off uh, December first. My beer, I have my own beer company, uh, the Grow Father Beer, the cannabis beer. That kicks off December first. But I'm really concentrating on the on the entertainment right now. Yeah, but you've lived that life, man. That's a fucking that's a mo that's a movie. Three sequels is it's just your life that you've just told me is is mad. Well, I understand in your, your country, England, they're producing a lot. They're, they're producing a lot of American stuff here. So I want to hook up with somebody to do my life story. Yeah. For anybody that's watching, George that's, George, that's in a life of struggle, what advice would you have for them? Someone who doesn't think there's a way out, what advice would you have for them? Well, they just got to find somebody like me or you to have to get around the right people. There's no, there's no getting around the wrong people. I have, I have a store called the Hip Hip Cafe. I had several... And uh, we had, you know, Philadelphia's real bad, uh, North Philly, North Philly majority black, deep North Philly majority black. And those kids, uh, there's no future for them. And uh, they all got these ghost guns and they're out there and what they committing crimes, murders. And um, they they don't believe they uh going to live <coughs> to 19, let alone 21. That is their mentality. And I had uh, six kids, six black kids working for me uh, in the summer. So in the summer, you know, it gets dark. It gets dark later. So now it's time to it really gets dark. It's 830. These kids can't go home. They can't go back to the hood because they don't have guns. And the kids with guns are waiting for them because they know they got money. They're coming home from a job. So this past summer, I had to rent an apartment. And I put some bunks in there. So the ones that didn't go home, they they could stay there so they can get killed. So not when you, an employer today in certain parts of the city, you got to go beyond being an employer. You have to be a, actually be a protector. See, you've lived that life. You've stayed strong with that life, never snitched. Why does a lot of people in that life of crime turn on each other? They don't want to do the time. You know, a lot of, a lot of guys that, that flip, it, it could be Italians, it could be blacks, it could be Mexican. A lot of guys that flip, this is probably the first time the world's going to hear it. A lot of guys cannot be without a woman. A lot of guys flip that way. They'll make up stories, you know, but the real reason, a lot of an adult don't, wants to be with a woman. So they realize, well, geez, I'm, I'm never going to have a woman again. And that's a, that's a big deterrent why a lot of guys flip. 
So big plans for the future then. Life is going good. You're looking great. What are you, 72, George? 73. Fucking look great, man. Putting a lot of these boys... Well, I have a saying for that. Looking good's a business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> George, your boy, would you like to finish up on anything else? Just like I said, uh, I like to come and come and visit you over there. Anytime. I love... Uh, you know, I've seen movies about Scotland. Braveheart. I don't know, they Braveheart. Did yeah. they film that? Yeah, Scotland and Ireland. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Ireland, I got a good good friend. I don't know if you ever heard Joe Doherty. They got a street named after him in New York. And he wrote books about him. They have a song. He's the famous IRA prisoner that escaped out of the maze. He mm -hmm. shot his way out of the maze prison. Mm -hmm. And he actually lived here in New York until he got caught. And uh and he was he was on the mob he was on the mob cheer with us. It was old mob guys and he was on the chair and he he used to come out of his cell. He used to come out of his cell. I'm surrounded by the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> the Irish are fucking crazy. I had, I've had a couple of IRA men on. Sam Miller, he was IRA, came to New York, done one of the biggest heists. Um, John Crawley, but he ended up involved with Whitey Bulger. But I think he was a fucking nutcase. Um, the IRA men are solid. You ought to do Joe. Joe's doing very well. He's a counselor now. He got out of prison. He spoke up right against the IRA counseling kids he's he's a good guy and he went he went through a lot awful lot mm -hmm. he's a good guy for if you ever want to interview how can people get in contact with you george your businesses your books or anybody that's wanting to reach out for advice ah uh, jeez that's uh how to get in contact you get social media or tiktok i'm on tiktok they can get a hold of me on tiktok what's your name on tiktok george martirano email yeah 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 oh my email yeah okay my email is the number 32 because mm -hmm. i did 32 years in prison and the one word handsome jack h-a-n-d-s-o-m-e-j-a-c-k at gmail.com 32 handsome jack and it's all symbolic because i did 32 years and for some reason some years back when i was teaching one kid started calling me professor handsome jack and that stuck with me throughout the years so 32 handsome jack at gmail.com george absolute pleasure mate i wish pleasure. you nothing but the best for the future and i look forward to seeing you in scotland right right, right god bless you right, george all right